Hey, it's nice to be back. As I said last week, there's no performance pressure uh, because I know you love me. And so, um, you know, it's just... <laughs> it, it's, true that, it's true that my own home church quite likes me, uh, but I have been there 17 years. It's taken them a while to warm up, but... Uh, you guys, and not just uh, this campus, but uh, I felt love from people at the East Paris, Kentwood, Knapp Street, and even online, because people send me messages and, uh, and say, I, I, I heard you last week, and thank you. Uh, in fact, I, I met someone downtown uh, this week uh, who is from uh, Knapp Street or East Paris, one of those, and a uh, delightful guy, and was really appreciative uh, of the ministry. And he said he'll be watching today online in Germany. So how cool is that? Big shout out to Colin in Germany. <laughs> Guten Tag, wie geht es Ihnen? Auf Wiedersehen, and all that. <laughs> I should really get going. Uh, <laughs> Jeff, you'll remember, if you were here last week, uh, you'll know Jeff has asked me to do something a little bit different, not the normal straightforward Bible teaching that is the bread and butter of any church, but to spend three weeks looking at what's the difference between the various religions. I used to teach the world religions uh, in the history department at Macquarie University, so it's something I've been a student of for many years and love talking about it, and it's a privilege that Jeff invited me to talk about the world religions and compare, contrast uh, with the Christian faith. And I said last week, right at the outset, that there are two mistakes people very often make when they explore the world religions. One mistake is to so blur the distinctives that you end up trying to make all the religions say the same thing. You emphasize sameness. The other mistake, of course, is to cast other people's religions in the worst light possible. So you can't even see what they see about their religion. Now, as we turn today to look at Islam, I think this is a special problem. Because ever since 9-11 and all that has followed since, people in the West have tended to rush either to defend Islam entirely by trying to make Islam just like Christianity. They're just the same. There's no difference. Or people have rushed to cast Islam in the worst light possible, to say that it is completely incompatible with the modern world. Well, I don't think either of those approaches honors any religion. You don't honor the world faiths by trying to make them say all the same thing. And you don't honor the faiths by casting them in their worst light. As I said last week, you honor the world faiths by turning all the gallery lights on full and look at all these major works of art, so to speak, in their best light. You don't shine the spot on your favored piece and dim the lights on all the others. No, you turn all the lights on full and allow each religion to show its distinctive colors. And you strain as best you can to see what others see in their religion. Especially with Islam, because Islam uh, represents uh, nearly 1.5 billion people on the planet. It's a lot of humans that we share this planet with. And I think we have a special obligation to see what they see in Islam. Even if you are absolutely committed to the truth and lordship of Jesus Christ over all things, as I am, perhaps especially if that's you, we have an obligation to pause and listen and see what others see in Islam. And I reckon if we do this, you'll not only understand Islam better than you ever have, you may actually see your own Christian faith in a fresh light. 
So I'm going to help us uh, today by doing something that may sound a little bit weird, okay? Uh, I'm not going to give you a Christian account of Islam, let alone a Christian critique of Islam. I'm actually going to explain what our Muslim neighbors would say is wrong with Christianity. I'm going to explain what they see as deficient in Christian faith. And I think you'll agree by the end, if not right in this moment, by the end, that this is a helpful way of seeing not only what is distinctive about Islam, but also seeing the Christian faith in a fresh light. Okay, sound like a plan? I have five things, I think, that uh, Muslims would say is not quite right about the Christian faith. And the first is very simple, and all the other criticisms flow from this. The Muslims will say the New Testament has been corrupted. The, the document that we revere as the Word of God, those of us who are Christians, uh, Muslims will say it's been corrupted. Now, the interesting thing is, Islam teaches two things in tension about Christianity, and Judaism, by the way. On the one hand, Islam calls uh, Christians and Jews people of the book, ahal al-kitab, and it's an honor to be a person of the book. And the idea is that God gave a revelation to the Jews through Moses. And God gave a revelation to the Christians uh, through Jesus. We are people of the book. On the other hand, that doesn't mean the people of the book who live today are correct. No. On the other hand, Islam teaches that the books have been modified, have been corrupted over the time. So yes, God revealed himself to Moses. Yes, God revealed himself to Jesus. But the disciples of both corrupted the teaching. So here's what the Quran says about the people of the book. Oh, people of the book, this means Christians and Jews, do not exceed the bounds in your religion unjustly and do not follow the fancies of a people who went astray in the past and led others astray and strayed from the right path. This is why God had to restore the truth to the world in the Quran, the holy book of Islam, the perfect revelation that to correct the corruptions that are found in uh, the New Testament and the Old Testament. One day in AD 610, the 40-year-old businessman we know as Muhammad received a revelation, so the texts tell us. He heard a voice say, Quran, Quran, which means recite, recite. And then he was given things to recite. And from that day in 610 until his death in 632, Muhammad received frequent revelations from the angel Gabriel who recited to him and then he recited to others and those recitations ended up in the book that we call the Quran. By definition, this relegates all previous revelations, all previous disclosures of God. Yes, Moses was a prophet, Jesus was a prophet, Islam says. But where the Old and New Testaments depart from the teaching of the Quran, that's where you see the corruptions the Jews and Christians have made to their own text. Okay. But here's the question I like to ask my Muslim neighbors or taxi drivers or Muslims I've had public debates with. Very simple question. Where is the evidence for an earlier Islamic form of Jesus' teaching, which has been corrupted? I think it's a fair question. We have well over 5,000 ancient manuscripts of the New Testament. One of the earliest, by the way, is in the University of Michigan Library, and I hope to view it this week. One of the earliest fragments of, uh, of Paul's letters are there. So the question is, wouldn't there be some text amidst all the thousands that has a hint of Jesus originally teaching Islam and then it being 
perverted? I think it's a decent question. Uh, of course, Muslims have a reply that will go along the lines of uh, they corrupted it pretty much immediately, and that's why there's no evidence uh, for it. Okay. In a sense, all other criticisms of Christianity arise from this first one. For Muslims, since the text is corrupt, so are the ideas. And I want to walk through a few more of the ideas that Muslims would say are deficient in the Christian faith. And then I want to raise a question or two that I put to my Muslim friend. So here's the second thing. Muslims will say, God did not let Jesus die on the cross. Now, I've been hanging around this church long enough to know that Jesus' death on the cross is rather important to Christianity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's at the very center, of course. There's that beautiful text in uh, Philippians 2 that says, Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. But this is ruled out by the Quran explicitly in section four of the Quran. They neither killed nor crucified Jesus. But it was made to appear so unto them. Indeed, those who differ about him are in doubt about it. Their knowledge does not go beyond conjecture. And they did not kill him for certain. Rather, Allah raised him unto him. Allah is mighty and wise. Why would Islam say Jesus didn't die on a cross? What's behind this complaint, this critique? It has to do with the kind of fate God in his wisdom and power would allow a holy prophet like Jesus to face. Crucifixion was regarded as the most shameful, disgusting of deaths in antiquity. And it is just unthinkable that Allah would allow the great holy prophet Jesus to suffer such a shameful death. That's what's going on here. And this gives us insight into one of the kind of um, ethos differences between Christianity and Islam. Islam is way more into honor than Christianity is. Honor for God, of course. Honor for the prophets. Honor for the name of Islam. Honor. And the cross is a dishonor. But here's the question I raise to uh, Muslim uh, neighbors and interlocutors if they give me a chance. Outside the Quran, which of course was written 600 years after Christ, is there any evidence that Jesus suffered a fate other than crucifixion? I mean, we have a multiplicity of evidence from the first and second centuries from Christian, Jewish, and Roman authors all agreeing that Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate. So where's the evidence that he died in some other way? Now, again, Muslims have a reply that basically goes like this. It doesn't matter how much historical evidence there is, the Quran is the word of God. And it trumps all historical evidence. And you can say, okay, I can see the logic of that. But there's a third and even more important criticism Muslims will make of the Christian faith. It is this. Jesus is not divine. Central to the Christian faith from the beginning is the claim that Jesus was not just a prophet, teacher, healer, and so on. He is actually God in the flesh. You see him, you see God. This has been central from the beginning. It wasn't invented by the councils and creeds of the later church. It's what the original documents say. I mean, that passage I mentioned a moment ago, Jesus being in very nature God. 
did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, rather made himself nothing. Jesus is God. In fact, I'm pretty sure I didn't dream that I gave a sermon entirely on this question here last year. I'm not sure if anyone remembers it. Kyle, you remember it? It's true. It's not just something I dreamt and thought, one day I want to preach at Ada on Jesus says God. <laughs> but to Muslims, this is highly problematic, both logically and religiously. And I want you to feel the force of this complaint in section five of the Quran. Unbelievers are those who say God is the Messiah, the son of Mary. That's Christians. For the Messiah himself said, children of Israel, serve God, my Lord and your Lord. He that worships other deities besides God, God will deny him paradise and the fire shall be his home. The Messiah, the son of Mary, was no more than an apostle. Other apostles passed away before him. His mother was a saintly woman. They both ate earthly food. Remember that expression, because I'll return to it in a moment. It is hard to stress how seriously Muslims feel you must not say Jesus is God. It is blasphemous. Uh, I had a lovely conversation with my Lebanese Muslim taxi driver a little while ago. Uh, and here's a hot tip, by the way. If you know you're in a taxi with, a, with a, a Muslim, or just meet a Muslim on the street, you can be sure they're up for talking religion. They're not weirded out like our creepy Anglos, right? Who go, oh, we don't talk about religion, you know. <laughs> no, 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 Muslims, they, they totally think this should be part of the public discussion. So you just go for it. Anyway, I always go for it. And I could tell he was a Muslim, so I asked him about uh, his faith. Turns out he was really devout. He said his five daily prayers. He uh, practiced Ramadan, the, the fast of Ramadan. We happen to be in the month of Ramadan right now, by the way. Um, uh, finishes on Tuesday. Uh, and he was about to make his Hajj, his pilgrimage to Mecca, which is an obligation of every able Muslim. So he was a serious Muslim. So then I asked him about Jesus and just tried to move the conversation on. And he had nothing but positive things to say about Jesus. Jesus was a holy prophet, a healer. We love Jesus in Islam, he said. So then I thought, I'll take a shot. I asked him about me as someone who believes that Jesus was actually more than a prophet, that he was God in the flesh. Without blinking, without any sense of rudeness, he said, God will throw you into hellfire. <laughs> At which point we pulled up outside my house at the end of the journey. I thanked him very much and went on my way. <laughs> to say that Jesus is God is to commit, seriously, the worst sin in Islam. It's a sin called shirk, which means association. To associate a created thing, a physical object, with the eternal, immaterial Lord of the universe. And therefore, to say Jesus is God is to do exactly that. Because central to Islam is the doctrine of tawid, oneness. In fact, Islam basically, you could say, begins with an extraordinary event around this building called the Kaaba. This is in Mecca, and you may have seen, um, uh, this is the great mosque of Mecca, that um, during the Hajj, there's one of the ceremonies, uh, tens of thousands of people circle the Kaaba, this black box, seven times. Why? Because this box, according to Islamic tradition, used to contain the 360 idols of Arabia, the false gods of Arabia. And when Muhammad uh, took uh, Mecca with his Islamic doctrine, one of the first things he did was clear all the idols out and reclaim the Kaaba for the one God. When Christians say Jesus is God, to the Muslim ear, this is trying to wind back this central event, this central doctrine of the oneness of God. But here's the question I like to raise uh, with Muslims if they give me a chance. 
while we must never associate a part of creation with the creator, agreed, is God able, as a pure act of his sovereign will, to become a man, if he so wished? Could he do it? Now, I've received uh, different answers to this question. One debate partner, Dia Muhammad, uh, who I did a lovely public conversation with, uh, I put this question to him, and he said, absolutely not. Which kind of raises the question about the limits of God's freedom and power. But I've had other Muslims say, yes, he could, but he didn't. Which, of course, raises the question whether the complaint against the doctrine that Jesus is God is really simply because the Quran says he isn't God, not because of any logical or theological contradiction. The fourth complaint. The New Testament's rejection of holy war is not in keeping with divine justice. Hmm. This is a very sensitive talk, so be kind to me in the next few minutes, all right? Or at least I get to leave in seven days, so <laughs> just go for it. Islam prides itself on being a religion, first and foremost, of justice. Justice. In fact, I heard an imam, a leader of a mosque, on BBC radio say... We Muslims, we love mercy, but we love justice even more. There is in that statement, I think, a, a very important insight into the mind and worldview of Islam. And so Jesus' teaching about non-retaliation that we're so used to, that we like to cite, is problematic from the Islamic point of view. Jesus in Luke 6, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Now, of course, most Muslims don't think Jesus said this. This is a good example of something that has been corrupted in the New Testament from the Islamic perspective. But it's problematic um, because Islam is so into justice. Now, it's out of this strong sense of justice, that Islam teaches a doctrine that you will have heard of, but maybe not made sense of, called jihad. You've heard this word? Jihad. Jihad means strive or struggle. And in some texts, it only means spiritual striving, spiritual struggling. So the way a Christian might say, oh, I'm really struggling with sin or, or I'm really trying to uh, conquer sin in my life, the Muslims use jihad in that same way. And there are other texts that clearly speak of military jihad. And here is one of the very important texts from the Quran. Fight for the cause of Allah those who fight you. But do not be aggressive. In context, this means the aggressor, the first striker. Surely Allah does not like the aggressors. Kill them wherever you find them and drive them out from wherever they drove you out. Sedition is worse than slaughter. Do not fight them at the sacred mosque in Mecca until they fight you at it. And if they fight you there, kill them. But if they desist, Allah is truly all forgiving and merciful. Fight them until there is no sedition and the religion becomes that of Allah. Thus, whoever commits aggression against you, retaliate against him in the same way. Fear Allah and know that Allah is with those who fear him. Now, my Muslim conversation partners over the years have stressed to me what I want to stress to you, that jihad is meant to be a second strike, not first strike. 
Not the aggressor, but the responder, okay? It's a matter of justice for those who attack Islam physically or dishonor Islam. The notion of turning the other cheek, of loving your enemies, of doing good to those who hate you is foreign to Islam, not because Islam is mean, but because it is just and justice reigns supreme for Muslims. But of course, here's the question I like to put to Muslim neighbors. Which is more likely to end the spiral of violence and foster peace? Just retaliation for wrongs or a merciful willingness to love the enemy? My last point is also related to justice. Fifthly then, God's favor cannot be found through a substitutionary atonement. God's favor cannot be found through a substitutionary atonement. Now, I've been around this church long enough to know that this is central to Christianity and to this church, rightly so, that there's nothing we could do to atone for our wrongdoings, but God in his love entered the world in Jesus, died on a cross where he bore into himself our sin and the penalty for sin, that, that he would atone for our sins so that we might be freely forgiven. Now, you know I'm not making this up, but just in case you think I might be, Romans 3 makes pretty clear. <laughs> All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament says. And here it is, all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Central to Christianity. And therefore, it's difficult for Christians to get into their heads why this would be an affront to any other religion. We saw last week when we dealt with uh, Buddhism and, and Hinduism that this notion of free forgiveness is an affront to the idea that you need to own up for your own wrongdoings and work toward your own redemption. It's a cop-out. It's lazy. If you're the problem, you've also got to be the solution. Don't just sort of flick past it. Oh, that's a different code, isn't it? Uh, that's a football move in Australia, but don't worry. <laughs> Forgot where I was. <laughs> I'm sure that looked awful, but anyway. <laughs> don't just flick it off to someone else to carry your load. Now, here's the Islamic principle stated very clearly in chapter six. Every soul is accountable for what evil it commits and no soul shall bear the burden of another soul. This could almost be a statement against the Christian doctrine of substitutionary atonement. This principle rules out atonement by someone else. This principle also lies behind Islam's insistence that you can and must atone for your own sins by performing the Arkan al-Islam, the famous pillars of Islam, the five deeds that are obligatory for anyone who wants a hope of salvation. And here are the Arkan al-Islam, the five pillars of Islam. Hadith al-Bakari is one of the principal texts of Islam. And here's Muhammad himself. Allah's messenger said, Islam is based on five principles. And here they are. One, confession. To testify that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah. And Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. So there's a creed in Islam that you have to say out loud in Arabic, sincerely, to be a Muslim. Prayer, number two. To offer the compulsory prayers dutifully and perfectly. These are the five daily prayers that you'll find every devout Muslim is trying to do. Three, uh, tax, uh, to pay zakat. This is 2.5% of gross income given to the mosque to be used for important purposes. Okay, every Muslim is obliged to give 2.5%. Pilgrimage to Mecca, that is to perform 
Hajj. Once in their life, every able-bodied Muslim is to make a trip all the way to Mecca and perform about eight to 10 days of rituals that cleanse you from sins. And the fifth pillar is to observe fasts according to Islamic teachings during the month of Ramadan. We are, we are near the end of Ramadan uh, right now. Finish this on Tuesday. By the way, if you have any Muslim neighbors, try and get yourself invited to the feast they're going to have on Tuesday night. Because <laughs> it will blow your mind. And they will be very pleased to have you along. Get in there and taste the food. Oh my goodness. That's just a pro tip. <laughs> but the point is, there are five pillars of Islam that you have to do in order to atone for your sins. And two of these deeds are particularly potent, according to the texts, for undoing sins. And they are, uh, firstly, to give money to the poor. To give alms publicly is commendable, but to keep it secret and give it to the poor is better for you and will atone for some of your sins. See that? Give money you will actually atone for some sins. And the second activity is prayer. This is from Al-Bakari 300. I heard the prophet saying, if there was a river at the door of any one of you and he took a bath in it five times a day, would you notice any dirt on him? They said, not a trace of dirt would be left. The prophet added, that is the example of the five daily prayers with which Allah blots out evil deeds. This is not to say Muslims think they ever end up earning salvation as a right. This is often misunderstood by Christians. That's not quite how they think of it. They certainly don't think of it as free through the atonement of someone else, but they, they don't really think of it as a payment, you know, as a complete right. It's something in between. It's more like a contract. Allah has contracted that if you perform certain deeds atoning for certain sins, he'll make up the difference. And so here's a text that makes this point clear. Recite then what you can of the Quran, which is a meritorious deed to recite the Quran. Perform the prayer, give alms, and lend Allah a fair loan. Whatever good you forward for your soul's sake, you shall find it with Allah growing into a greater good and a greater good wage. Seek Allah's forgiveness. Allah is indeed all forgiving, all merciful. In other words, do as much good as you possibly can and you'll atone for part of your sins and Allah will make up the rest. How different is this from the text I just read you from Romans? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. But here's the question, or at least two questions, that I put to Muslims. Firstly, how can you ever know when you've done enough to enjoy God's favor? I think it's a good existential question to ask your Muslim neighbors. And it's interesting, you will very frequently find that they will admit that they don't know even if they are super committed. In fact, perhaps especially if they are super committed, they will say, I can't know. It's entirely up to Allah's will. I had an extraordinary conversation with a student at the University of Western Australia who was the leader of the Muslim group. And it was the open day for the university where students come in and look at the different stalls, uh, you know, the chocolate stall, the chess club stall, the, you know, the beer making stall, etc. cetera. Uh, it is Australia, by the way. Uh, and, um, and there was the Islamic stall. And no one was talking to the Islamic guy and I felt bad, so I went and chatted to him, started asking him about his faith and he was, he was delighted to talk about the faith, they always are, uh, and delighted that I knew something about his faith and, and we, we sort of drilled down and I, and I asked him, do you say your daily prayers? And he said, oh yeah, I always um, make sure I find time to pray to the Creator. I said, oh, so you say your five daily prayers. He was surprised that I knew he was meant to say five daily prayers. I will never forget, he suddenly looked very uh, pensive 
and said, you know, I'm so busy with university and with work, I, I often only get to do three of my five prayers. I asked, what do you think Allah thinks of you for that? He said, I'm worried what Allah thinks of me. Beautiful sincerity, a straining, but a not knowing. The second question I ask is less existential and more kind of philosophical. If God demands atonement for some sins, how does he forgive the remaining sins without atonement? So if it's an absolute rule that you must atone for your sins, or some of them, how does God let you go for the other sins? Or to put it the other way, if God can freely forgive some sins, why not other sins? It's a question of consistency. Now, Muslims have a reply that basically says God's free to do whatever he likes. It's his contract. I don't have any rights in this. If he tells me the way of salvation, I just got to do it. Okay. Let me try and conclude. One of our major newspapers at Christmas time, uh, a few years ago, published this extraordinary article titled The Love That Crosses the Great Divide. And the journalist's motive was wonderful. The journalist wanted to sort of see Muslims and Christians get along. And his idea was, you both love Jesus, so can't you just focus on that? And in a moment of unnoticed irony, uh, the journalist wrote, the Islamic Jesus is not the Jesus who was the son of God, admittedly, and who was crucified, but certainly the Jesus who was Messiah and miracle worker, who conversed regularly with God, who was born of a virgin and who ascended into heaven. Can't you all just agree on that? What he didn't realize, of course, is he's just asking Christians to give up the Christian Jesus and follow the Muslim Jesus, which is no solution to the problem. It's this whole thing of trying to make religions all basically the same. No, you don't honor the religions doing that. You let them share their distinctive views that cannot be reconciled. I'm all for crossing the great divide, but not that way. In reality, Islam and Christianity offer two very different visions, not only of the person of Jesus, but also of God himself and salvation. And this came home powerfully to me some years ago when I was giving a lecture at the University of Western Sydney on the theme of Christ's divinity. I was giving a kind of historical, theological thing about how amazing it is. Christians uh, argued that Jesus was God right from the beginning. And I focused on the crucifixion narrative, actually, in this lecture, and pointed out that Christians uh, believed that God emptied himself and died on a cross, and that isn't this extraordinary that Christians would think that about God? Anyway, I thought the lecture went reasonably well, if I don't mind saying so myself. Uh, and then the chairman opened the floor for questions, which I love, usually. First hand goes up. The man's chosen. He stands up. He's wearing a lovely suit. He's a very articulate, uh, very polite gentleman. But for the next five minutes, he denounced everything I'd just said. Turns out he was a Muslim and an academic in the university, which was just my luck. <laughs> he said, what we've heard today is both illogical and blasphemous. I could see where this was going. Illogical, he said, because are you saying God had to eat food? Aha, remember that text from the Quran where the clincher argument that Jesus isn't God is that he had to eat food, his daily food? And then he said, I've never had anyone put this question to me, are you saying God had to go to the toilet? Ooh, that's confronting. And then he said, more than logic, it's, it's surely blasphemy to associate a physical thing, a tangible thing, a defined thing, a finite thing with infinite majesty of God. It's illogical and a blasphemy. He was very civil, uh, but adamant that Christianity made no sense. 
and was a blasphemy. Well, I did my best over the next few minutes in a very nervous few minutes for the audience where we went backwards and forwards. I did my best to answer his questions, but it soon became clear there was no winner in this debate. Because our premises were miles apart. His vision of God's majesty absolutely excluded any idea that God would degrade and dishonor himself. Whereas my vision of God's majesty consists precisely in the idea that almighty God degraded and dishonored himself for my forgiveness and salvation. So in the end, all I could do, the only thing I could think of doing, was thank him very much for drawing to the audience's attention the profound difference between Islam and Christianity. What is blasphemous to Islam, that God would dishonor himself for us, is the very center and beauty and glory of the Christian faith. who being in very nature God, humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. My Muslim neighbors say blasphemy. I say hallelujah. So Lord, will you please speak to each one of us today? Help us to be fair and honest and open with our Muslim neighbors in this country. Help us to seek to understand first. Help us to extend grace. But Lord, I do pray that all of us might see the Christian faith in a fresh light. To see your humility, your love. For we ask it in the name of Jesus. Jesus.